Tainer, it's lovely to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. What does it feel like to be about to be able to perform live in front of audiences again? I get to do my job, something that I feel I have the right to do. I'm incredibly excited, um, not only for myself, I'm excited for the collective, I'm excited for an industry that's been on pause for over a year now. Mm. Is there any substitute for the connection that a performer has with a live audience? No. A screen will never, ever replace the beautiful alchemy that happens between human beings. It just, it can never do that and it will never do that. No algorithms, doesn't matter how intelligent they all think they are, they can knock themselves out. It's just, it will never replace that human chemistry, ever. What do you think about when you're performing? Are you thinking about the technical side of it? Or are you thinking about the audience? Are you thinking about the words of the song? What's running through your mind? How about all of the above? <laughs> all of the above, you know, terrified about lyrics. Because obviously, you know, the remembering of lyrics is something. It's a muscle. You've got to train that muscle, you know. So you, you're worried about whether you're going to mess a lyric up. You're worried about whether people are enjoying the moment. You're worrying about whether... You worry about a lot of things, but I think the most important thing about the, this next time going out is that I'm comfortable and peaceful in my place and that the imperfections are what it is and I, um, I embrace all of that. Nothing is ever perfect and it's not what I'm searching for. It's Young Talent Time! And Miss Tina Arena as they trip the You hold a unique place of affection, I think, um, in Australians' hearts because they've known you for a really long time. In your ARIA Hall of Fame speech in 2015, you said that Young Talent Time was really important in teaching you your craft. What important things did it teach you? It gave me values. It made me understand and respect that my craft, our craft, or the arts, is not something that is individualistic. It's a collective. I'm not able to do my job without a wonderful team of people who support you through the good, bad, and the indifferent. And it is that collective that actually enable the show to go on. So Young Talent Time was an exquisite experience that could certainly never be repeated today because we don't live in the same Society, we're not set up, we're not configured the same way. So it really was a, a core, a roots, a real traditional education of listening, watching, talking, doing in a very organic and traditional way. And that, those values were something that were instilled in me as a little girl and I'm... You know, I'm, it's invaluable. I can't estimate any of that. What do you think if you ever see clips of yourself as a little girl singing? You I get really emotional now. I think maybe because I have a real respect for that little girl. Probably more so now as a parent and sort of realising being the mother of a 15-year-old young man who's growing up in a very, very different world who I haven't seen, you know, hanging out of a tree or, or you know, running through the fields for a long time because his entire generation spends their time on a phone. And that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart that... And I have told him recently, I've said, you know, as... Busy as my childhood was, I had an exquisite childhood, you know. I was on a bike, we were in a court and we had lots of neighbours and lots of kids that came from different cultures. It was exquisite and I keep saying to Gabriel, I wish that I could give you just a chapter of my childhood so you could actually see how beautiful it, it actually was. When did you realise that singing was your purpose? 
Ooh, I was pretty young. I think I would have to say that I was probably under five when that became really apparent to me. That's an incredibly fortunate thing, isn't it, to mm. have that? So Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's, it is about purpose and everybody needs a purpose. Everybody. And also fortunate that you felt it was your purpose and you were also a brilliant singer. Imagine if you felt that that was your calling in life but you were sort of a mediocre singer. Yeah, well, it, uh, yeah, it's a reality, you know, but there were other things that I wanted to be too, you know. I, I, and I had desires of being able to go on and continue tertiary education and I never took that time to, you know, my sister went to university and my friends all went to university and, and a part of me felt like I was a bit of a failure in that department because I'd never gone on to fulfil those studies because I was so categorically aware at an early age of what I wanted to do. So that took me a while to get over that. You know, I mean, I've got my friends that, you know, they've all, they've done pretty well, you know. But that was their calling and the arts was my calling. So as time has gone, I'm comfortable in that. It's a very universal experience to feel um, that you're a failure in some aspects of your life. How mm. have you learned to accommodate that and accept those feelings and not allow them to derail you? Well, you know, I've obviously been de derailed emotionally. You know, I grew up in an era where it wasn't terribly cool to be ethnic. I was also in an industry surrounded by an incredible amount of misogyny and, and really poor behaviour, um, to which I am very, very aware of now as a, as a mature woman. Um, I don't know, how do I, how do I just, I just get on, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, it's my education, it's my family education, you know, you, you get to a certain point where you realise there are going to be stumbling blocks, but it's how you manage those stumbling blocks. I was reading that um, young people are obsessed with Sorrento Moon and that they love singing it at festivals and that it's just become a sort of real thing among younger music fans. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, those younger music fans that you're perhaps referring to are the children of those parents who grew up with me and where Don't, a Don't Ask became a sort of soundtrack of their lives. And I find it so exquisitely beautiful that they have been able to transcend that record and those stories and melodies have been passed down in generations. It's an extraordinary privilege for me. It's really humbling in the true sense of the term for me. It makes me quite emotional. I go, how did that happen? But I guess it happened because Sorrento Moon came from a very, very honest place. I remember being 15, my son's age. I remember sitting on the back beach of Sorrento and watching all these kids, these guys and these girls surf and their interactions. And I remember feeling like such an outcast because I wanted so much to be a part of that and realised that I never could be and that I never would be. So I chose to write about it. You wait a long time to find your dream and hold on to it and all I need it was to fly it's been a long Sweet Sorrento moon. 